Hey, John, it's good to see you. I'm really excited to have you on Building a Better World podcast. Um, I'm very excited to have uh, my guest, John Radoff, who is a illustrious uh, serial entrepreneur, CEO of Beamable, um, just a long prolific career in the gaming space and the metaverse space. And, and again, I'll let you, uh, you know, give a full intro on your background, but really excited to have you here and excited to jump into all topics that we're going to go into, into gaming and metaverse and your adventurous, uh, life as well. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. This is going to be fun. Awesome. Um, well, I'd love to hear more about kind of what got you to Beamable and in your background and, you know, the, the first companies you started kind of give us a kind of lay of the land kind of how did you what was your journey like? Um, well, something I told people a bunch of times is that I, I feel like I've always been in the metaverse because I think the first metaverse was Dungeons and Dragons kind of defines the way I think of what the metaverse is, which is this realm of like shared imagination and shared storytelling, creative freedom. Um, so that's that's kind of how I got my start. And, and like I wanted to be involved in a lot of the technologies that could start digitizing and dematerializing that experience. So uh, I started making video games as a kid. I had a couple of online games actually that you could play. One was called Space Empire, another called Final Frontier. Um, but I went from that to then met my future wife in an online game and I was in college at the time. So I dropped out of college and moved across, she moved across the country and we started a game studio together that built one of the first online games on the internet, which was a game called legends of future past. Awesome. And I've gotten, I've just been super lucky in my life. I got to do a lot of creative things that I wanted to do. Not only that, but then I started a creator platform for making websites to just help people who were less technical, just launch websites back when you had to know how to program basically to launch a website. I've been involved in data analytics for game companies with a company called Gamer DNA. I built games. So I built some mobile games based on really popular TV shows. So Star Trek and Game of Thrones. Um, and these days I'm, I'm running Beamable. And Beamable is all about providing game developers with the infrastructure that they need to go from simply having like a 3D engine that could display a world, give you the window into the world. We're like the underpinnings of that in terms of being, to ha being able to have a history and a memory and a set of rules that live on up in the cloud for your games. So Beamable is infrastructure to build virtual worlds for metaverse for games. And it all just kind of ties back to, I guess, my my values in life and what I'm excited about. I think there's two things that that reach the top for me, and that's just curiosity and creativity. And I want to be able to infect the world with a lot more creativity and curiosity. Mm -hmm. And a way to do that is to just give people ways to express themselves through virtual worlds, through games, through creativity. Awesome. Yeah, that those two uh, attributes are are something I'm I'm both very excited about as well. I think that's the you know the core of uh, what we're seeing with the creator economy, where we're kind of empowering anyone to be able to you know build and and to grow and to monetize and to build livelihoods uh, using these mediums. I'd love to dig into Beamable a bit more, and you know if you'd like, um, I'd love to hear more about you know, some of the features and some of the ways that you uh, help uh, game developers um, or, you know, uh, some of the ways that you kind of enable that curiosity and creativity. It, it starts with the way you actually build games. So once upon a time, you had to build every aspect of a game, right? So if you go back to like um, the earliest game developers, they were building their own game engines. And then when 3D graphics was new, like people were building their own 3D engines. And that's the way it continued for a while. Um, you used to have to know like how to do matrix math and quaternions and, and all kinds of tricky things or, or a whole set of hacks just to do graphics. Eventually, some companies came along and just made it a lot easier. So the Unity is one of those companies. Unity makes a platform that allows you to have this completely composable environment for 3D graphics with scripting and the ability to import all your assets in and have essentially one work hub. Um, Epic Games 
has for many years been building a technology called Unreal Engine. So in, in their case, it's, it's a competitor to Unity. But those are today the two major 3D engines that people use, and they've made it a lot easier to build games. So what we found is that when people were building a modern game, and a modern game almost always has online components. These are living games. You're competing with people. You're cooperating with people. There's persistent worlds under it. It has to remember what you did has to have rules that keep it fair for everybody. So all of that stuff requires cloud-based infrastructure, essentially ways to store it up in the cloud. And you have to be able to scale that up for enormous numbers of people. Like a very successful game can have millions and millions of players. And what we found, having done it ourselves, and, and we're no exception, is you had just had to build all that stuff yourself. So you're cobbling together databases and choosing whatever random programming language you wanted to. You usually like grab like web server technology and like try to connect a web server to your game as a way to remember things. And those things work, but they're clumsy. They are hard to scale. Uh, they're fraught with risks in that you can make a mistake. And if your game is successful at getting millions of people to try it out, maybe you'll fall over and won't even be in business anymore after all that effort. So we we really wanted to solve that part of the problem because we lived it ourselves. So we wanted to be like, just like 3D engines solved all this complexity in the front end, we wanted to solve that in the back end. The way we do it is actually very, very simple, which is since everybody works in a 3D engine now, whether you're a game builder, a metaverse builder, you're building simulations, everyone's working in a 3D engine for these kind of things. So what we've done is we've essentially made it so you can keep working in the 3D engine and we extend the capabilities of these systems so that all of these back end capabilities like memorizing what you did in a game and and linking you to other players and it's just all automated so that's that's what we've been at got it got it and what have you seen in terms of uh you know when you free up a game developer to not having to think about a lot of the back end and infrastructure and other things what, what kind of things have you seen that they've uh, been able to spend their time on in terms of development and creation of their games well, it means that they have time to spend on actually the important parts of games. So the important aspects of game development, as far as your customer, the, the player is concerned, is how fun it is. If it's not fun, you know, game over. You're not going to be in business. So players care that your servers work, right? If they're not working, they can't have fun. Um, but other than the risks you take on and building that yourself, like you can take on, you take on enormous risks and build it yourself, but you'll never add value back to that player. So really the principal requirements are that it works, that it supports the features you envisioned for your game, for your application. And what that means is that if you don't have to do that work anymore and you can stick to what you know, which is creativity and building a fun experience and tasking your team to, to deploy their skills that they're already familiar with. That means you can double, triple, maybe 10 X your creative output, which is absolutely critical in game development. It's, it's all a shots on goal formula, right? You, you need to take as many shots as you can at creative problem solving in a game because games are super hard to craft. They require a lot of testing, a lot of fiddling. You can have a lot of ideas in your head. Doesn't mean those ideas are always going to work without a lot of iteration and refinement for your customers. So we wanna make sure that game studios, whether game studio means you're just one person with a vision for an idea and you wanna do it yourself, or a huge team like a AAA publisher that's going to work for a few years building an enormous product. We want to make sure that you maximize the time across your team that you can spend doing that creative work and trust that there's an application layer under it that scales, supports features around you know, multi-user functionality, social systems, data persistence, all these things that you need for a virtual world mm -hmm. and that you can rely on it, that it works. It's 
awesome. I, I, you know, I, I'm so uh, passionate. I love the fact that you fight for game makers and, <laughs> and uh, you know, that was some of the, some of the things that you've said in the past and, and that's kind of what you stand for. Um, I, you know, one topic I want to go into is, you know, the metaverse and, and what's coming in the future. But before we get in that, I, I, I really love um, the adventurous side uh, of, of your life. Um, you know, I think you've, mention that if you're, you know, um, if you're not behind a computer screen or with your team, you know, you can be found in the kitchen or on top of a mountain or diving beneath the ocean. So I'd love to hear more about, you know, that side of your curiosity and creativity and, you know, what kind of drives you on a daily basis. Cool. Yeah. I don't, I don't get to talk about that stuff so much. So that, that's great that you're, that you're curious about it. So I'm, I'm the chef in my family, I should say cook because I have, I have a lot of uh, appreciation for real chefs and I'm definitely not one, but I, <laughs> but I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm learning all the time. I, I think it comes back to curiosity. There's also a, a whole social aspect to making a meal and sharing it with other people and, and being able to do that. So, so I, it's just so fundamentally human um, and basic for us. Like, I, I think it's just a really fun thing to learn that as a craft Mm -hmm. Um, when I go outside, it is, dis it is, uh, not low tech because technology has really evolved a lot for both scuba diving and mountain climbing, but it's not particularly computational other than me taking out the, the iPhone and taking a photo of wherever I am. But yeah, in the last year I, I got to visit Everest base camp in wow. Nepal. So that was amazing. Hiked around for a couple of weeks in the mountains there. Um, I've been on, you know, some of the highest mountains in the United States, all the ones on the West coast, um, all of the highest in each state, I should say, I don't think any human can get to all of them, but, uh, yeah, it, I, you know, I love getting outdoors again. It's, it's driven by curiosity. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I guess a certain aspect of it too, is as an entrepreneur, like, um, I don't know. Being an entrepreneur is a, is a bit of a of a mental disease where you you don't mind taking some risks, but especially maybe suffering through and, and abusing yourself a li little bit. So uh, I guess it connects back to um, to going up on mountains, which you know a lot of the time it's in in mountain climbing we say there's there's uh, type 1 fun and type 2 fun so type 1 is like normal fun that you're having at the time and type 2 you're kind of miserable at the time but when you remember <laughs> it later that that's fun to remember it and there's a, there's a lot of that and i think that uh it's kind of the same for entrepreneurs right uh, there is there's type 1 fun part of the time but it's a lot of type 2 fun to be an entrepreneur <laughs> Tell me about it. No, it's definitely <laughs> uh, a big part of uh, entrepreneurship. And, you know, for game makers, it, it's great that you're helping to solve some of that, uh, you know, help uh, ease some of the type two fun, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to hear, you know, and and one one thing I, I left out is you're, a, you know, a best-selling author and, uh, uh, you know, writer of the book Game On and, you know, probably have so many lessons from that as well. Um, can you tell me about some of the, the life lessons that you've kind of, uh, taken from, you know, the very variety of things that you've done, uh, your career, um, being a Harvard undergraduate in psychology, you know, you've done so many cool things. Um, what, what are some of the things that you think that, um, you know, as all of us, a lot of, uh, listeners, uh, and, you know, visitors here, of uh, to our podcast, you know, are interested in, in, in creating and building and, you know, you've been a builder and an explorer and adventurer and a writer. What, what are some of those things that you can pass on? So, but I, I should say best selling is probably a little bit of a reach, but, but that's, that's very nice. I'll, I'll take the compliment. Um, you know, I, I, I think, when if we go back to the idea of curiosity the thing that's intimidating about learning new things a lot of the time is especially when you're going into a vast space of new terms new things to learn whole concepts that feel alien to you it's mm -hmm. it, in if we import like a game system or, or a warfare term, there's like a fog of war all around you and you can barely see into it and you look and you, you don't really understand any, anything. There's complexity, 
there's a lot of unknown unknowns and that's super intimidating. So, you know, I, when I learn a new subject and when I wrote my book, that was, although I have done a lot of writing in my life, I'd never written a book, like writing a book is a little bit different because it has to have this big organization and publishers insisted on things like, what's your outline? And I was like, my goodness, an outline. I don't write two outlines. <laughs> you want an outline for me? So I had to give him an outline and then actually stick to it and have an editor. So it was like a learning process of its own. But um, you mentioned some of what I've done, you know, academically, which frankly, I just did for fun to indulge myself um, and my curiosity because I had been a college dropout when I started my game studio and I like squished in some some uh, college time between a couple of startups. Um, but I got to do cool things like, you know, go and be in like the computational biology lab where, where George Church, he's a, he's a world leading genomicist needed to teach biologists how to use a, more than how to use a computer, how do you apply computation to solving really hard problems in genomics? Uh, and I got to to do that. So I had to learn like biology and, and stuff that, that I hadn't really, you know, been super acquainted with since roughly high school. So I had to like learn that and then beyond, not because I was teaching biology, but I had to understand all this stuff to teach the computational aspects of it. So, you know, I, I guess the net of it, though, is you're going to see this fog of war when you're learning something new, whether it's writing a book for the first time, whether it's teaching a subject mm -hmm. that you haven't taught before, whether it's learning something with a vast um, space like biology or neuroscience or any of these things that, I, that I've gotten curious about in my life. You just have to dive in and like ignore the fact that there's a lot of things you don't know. Right. So you're going to see all these words and, and not know it the first time. Actually, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a teacher was actually from a Shakespeare teacher. And she, uh, the the professor who was teaching this Shakespeare course that I took, it's like, you know what? Like it like if you're not used to reading Shakespeare all the time, it it's it's kind of tough to get through. So don't try to understand everything the first time you read through. Just read through it sleep on it, then come back, read it a second time. And when you read it a second time, suddenly this weird jigsaw puzzle of language and concepts will, will fall into place. So that has actually stuck with me more than a lot of the more science-y, engineering -y things, even though mo the vast majority of stuff I do, do is either science or engineering or applying that to creativity in some way that stuck with me because when I read a science paper, for example, on artificial intelligence, and I don't know everything out of the gate, when I look at it, I just remind myself of that again, I'll read through it. Some stuff will make sense. Some won't. I'll go and research a bunch of the things in the fog of war. I'll come back. I'll read it again. Suddenly things start making sense. So that's, that's my best advice though, is like, just like, don't be too intimidated by mm -hmm. the fact that things are super confusing. In fact, embrace the fact that it is confusing and you're going to get through it and start learning things that few other people on, on this planet have a appreciation for. Yeah. And what happens, um, you know, when, you know, there's, there's setbacks and, you know, things don't work out and, and uh, you have challenges or, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the market timing is still kind of far out and we will get to the metaverse in a second, but, you know, things, uh, you know, what, what, what do you do when there's challenges? Um, how do you cope with those? How do you keep going? What's your, uh, ideas and thoughts on that? I wish there was an easy answer, but it, it's sort of like the job to the job of the entrepreneur is, to just keep going. Like what, one of my favorite books, um, is shoot is shoe dog by Phil Knight. Um, book. excellent book on entrepreneurship yeah. that if you're an entrepreneur and you have not read this book or you work for an entrepreneurial company, like you, you have to read this book. It's a, it's a quick read. Um, a lot of things happen. I won't spoil it, but there's just a lot of lessons there about building a company and, and, you know, what it can do to your life along the way. But I, I think the words he used was, you know, you just got to keep running, 
right? Keep running, keep doing it. So, um, you know, startups, you know, only fail at the point where they've exhausted all their cash and no one wants to give you any more. So until then, you've just got to keep keep running, keep fighting, keep trying to do the best you can and building it and hopefully learning along the way because any startup is a learning process as well. And certainly you are going to have a lot of things that you didn't understand or that you just flat out got wrong coming into it and be receptive, be humble through that learning process and accept that you're going to have to adapt along the way. And by the way, all through this whole process, on top of all that complexity, the whole market's changing around you all. Everything's changing. So even if the world was static and just didn't change, even then you would have to learn all kinds of stuff, right? That would be hard enough. But then the whole world, it's like adding this whole fourth or fifth dimension around everything at the same time as you're doing it. The only way is to just keep going, um, be resilient. I guess some of the things I do from a resilience standpoint, like um, I didn't always take care of my body that well, to be honest. And um, getting into things like climbing mountains and stuff, which are really hard goals to set for yourself, was for me setting up a system of aspirations and goals, kind of like a quest system that I imposed on myself because yeah. it puts it on the calendar and I get a date and it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to summit Mount Kilimanjaro on this date, which I've, I've been on the summit of Kilimanjaro. Um, well, I better get in shape for that because if I'm not, I'm either going to not make it or I'm going to be really hating it. So that kind of self-imposed quest system has, um, has paid off in terms of some fitness gains that frankly, I think that helps out in everything else I do in my life and including being an entrepreneur, increased energy levels and just overall resilience. Because I will say one thing, while we suffer as entrepreneurs and, and there's bad setbacks and, and uh, you know, a lot of mental setbacks at no point having either in coding a piece of software or leading a company or anything, have I felt the physical pain that I have um, going up a mountainside? So <laughs> so it reminds you that that we're physical beings and uh, and in some respects, entrepreneurship is easier in that way too. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. I love that and I love the the advice um, in a great book, shoe dog. Um, yeah, it's definitely one I need to reread. Um, so let's get let's get to it. The metaverse. Uh, what's your thoughts? Uh, give me some, you know, impressions. Uh, what's coming? What's the state of the metaverse? Um, would love to hear your take. Yeah. Um, well, I was I uh, I was into the metaverse before it was cool, which makes me a hipster. I read I read Snow Crash in the nineties, um, and I was talking about it before. Um, Mark Zuckerberg seemed to have become acquainted with that word and rebranded his company. Um, you know, it's gone through a pretty significant hype cycle. And now everyone who is using that word, who, who utilized it to, to, you know, try to, to grab some funding out there that, you know, a lot of those have died off. And those of us who still believe in the vision of the metaverse are, are moving forward. And, and I'm one of those, and I, I'm happy to keep using the term just like I did in the nineties and just like I did two or three years ago. So, you know, that said, let's talk about what the metaverse even means. Like usually people mean one of three things. Usually it's either like embodied 3d graphics, like AR VR kind of stuff, or they mean virtual world creation, like a developer, toolkit like Roblox to create experiences for people in a, in a, in a virtual world, which could be a game or could be a non-game application, or they mean more of like the economic interoperability aspect, which is usually what web three folks have in mind when, when they're talking about metaverse, they're referring to um, almost like the, the, the version of the world wide web, if it was 3d meaning 
not sort of visit web pages and now every web page is, is 3D. We tried that actually. It was called Vermal. No one liked it, but more about the interlinking and the interoperable aspects of it. So you have a hyperlink from a web page to another page. Well, maybe we'll have a hyper portal from location to location across 3D worlds. And maybe your things like your avatar and your property and the way you shape the world are interoperable elements that you can take from place to place. So that, that's the web three view. So anyway, all of those are technological lenses to understand metaverse. And I think they're all there. Um, and there's probably other technological aspects we just haven't even thought of yet, but the more important piece of metaverse is not even the technology. It's, it's what it means for culture. So, yeah. 20 years ago, um, you know, meeting someone in an online game, getting married, you know, something that I've done in my life, that would have been a little unusual or a lot unusual at that time. That's not unusual at all now. Like, no, like people heard, you know, maybe some people on this uh, podcast are hearing, oh, why does he think that's special? It was, it was unusual when I did that. And that's because we now live in this world where yeah. our identity has this digital representation that's important. It wasn't 20 years ago. It barely was 10 years ago. But because of the convergence of um, online games and then social networking, what we do online is just an important part of who we are for many hundreds of millions, even billions of people today. And that's really what metaverse is about. It's about how we project our identities into space, how we represent ourselves, whether that's the videos I upload to TikTok, the images I post to Instagram, the online games I play, the guild that I'm in as I play an MMO. All of those things collectively are a digital identity. And then the next step beyond this, which, which is the piece I'm particularly passionate about, is if it's about projecting ourselves into space and the, the next level of creativity that extends from that is how we shape those, those spaces around us? How do we actually create virtual worlds and experiences? Just like people started making web pages years ago, and then they started making profile pages and social networks. Well, in the future, we're all going to be crafting virtual spaces, and it's going to be games and entertainment part of the time. It may be music a, a big part of the time. We've already seen musical artists get tens of millions of fans to show up for concerts in Fortnite and Roblox. Um, an area that I'm excited about is the educational applications, because if you as a teacher can convey concepts within 3D space and you can just speak these concepts into existence using generative AI, and then you can bring other people and transform information and content and pass it back and forth. Like that's where we're going with all this technology. And, and But it's all going to come back to the idea that we're becoming digital humans in addition to our, you know, biologicalness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are still going to be climbing mountains and going under the ocean and cooking meals. Yeah. Uh, but there's now a digital piece of who we are. And yeah. to make ourselves able to relate to each other and really use these spaces more effectively, we got to be able to create there more effectively. And, and that's the piece that I'm really focused on solving. Yeah, no, I, I love that. You know, I think uh, what we're focused on at SuperWorld is really about, uh, you know, both of those aspects clearly, but, uh, you know, the physical part of the, the someone's reality is, is, is a big part of our, our vision. So I love that you know, you're, you're very much in both worlds and uh, creating in both worlds. And particularly the, the physical world is a very important part of how you think of the metaverse, which is, which is really important to us as well. I know you're an advisor to a number of companies, uh, some of which we're very close to as well. Uh, would love to hear kind of the advice that you're giving to companies in this space uh, in 2023. You know, you mentioned AI, you mentioned uh, market conditions, the changing market environment, um, you know, tech, uh, hardware, 
uh, XR. We're seeing a lot of announcements and things coming. What What's your thoughts on this year, the next few years? What kind of advice would you give a entrepreneur who's in this space or a brand or even just a user who's excited about getting into the metaverse? Well, I mean, we've, we've now suffered through this cycle in which a lot of people were, were using that word and uh, we're talking about making games based on a range of different technologies and particularly in Web3 where they really had no ability to execute um, and in many cases had no intention of executing, right? So I I think that fortunately people that fall into that kind of category are not getting a lot of funding today. So what it means is it's a good time to be someone who's going to start building something in earnest that, that you really want people to use. So I see a real scarcity of talent out there. I, th I think that's the number one observation I have. There's a scarcity of people that really know how to build applications, that really know how to utilize 3D graphics and create persistent experiences in, in these realms, whether that's a game, whether it's the educational or music applications or any of the others, shopping, fitness, like the list goes on and on of the use cases for immersive experience. Um, if you're someone who has the abilities to do that and you want to work in this, like this is a great time to do that because talent is scarce. If you don't have that, the best advice I could give you, though, is throw yourself in and start learning. Don't throw yourself in and go start, you know, pitching thin concepts and, and light papers intended to get, extract capital from naive investors because pro that probably isn't going to be successful for you. Um, but if you if you have a knowledge gap, it's also a great time for you because there's such enormous amounts of information online. Like you can learn just about anything you need to learn or want to learn online. You don't have to pay anyone any money for that. You don't have to go sign up for a course. Like go to YouTube, go to TikTok, look at blog pages. Like go into GitHub, look at an open source code project. It's all out there and like we were talking about earlier, if it's confusing to you at first, don't worry. That's part of the process. You don't need someone to hold your hand and tell you each little thing. Just start digging away at that problem and, and you know, get, tell yourself that as confusing it is, you're just going to be resilient and, and get through it. And, and if you tell yourself that, you will get through it and you'll learn the things that you need. But figure out which track you're really on right now. Are you someone who's going to have the actual expertise right now to go and execute? In which case, I think there's a lot of people who either want to work with you, hire you, co-found a company with you, or fund a company. Um, if you don't have that great time to learn, do it now. Don't wait right after you are done this podcast, say, you know what, there's this thing I want to learn, jump to another webpage, start learning it because it's there. Yeah, no, totally important to jump in and start, uh, learning and, you know, it's, it's never too late and it's, it's actually very early is what I tell people about this space is we're so early and so the the opportunity to spend time and jump in and and you know slowly become an expert um, is 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 very much uh, now. Uh, so I I, I really uh, think that's very important advice. W what do you think is um, the the key moment or the key set of moments um, that's going to lead to a more mainstream adoption of? the metaverse or some of these technologies? What do you, what do you think is coming in the future that's going to really get um, most of us on board? I I actually think it already is mainstream. Uh, like if I look at, at my own children, so I've got a, I've got twins, they're 11 years old. Like my kids are in the metaverse now. Like they go into Roblox, they do stuff in it. They use VR. They, they, they have grown up with this technology all around them. So I, I guess my first reaction to someone who says, oh, this stuff isn't mainstream yet is look at our younger generations 
and pay pay a little bit more attention because I think you're actually missing out on what's happening culturally um, with people in Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Um, no, I'm not I'm not in either of those for sure. But you know, I grew up with these things way uh, way before it was like usual. So like I feel like I'm um, kind of more culturally culturally connected to you know, the folks growing up right now than even to, to my peers in, in Gen X, just because when I was growing up as a Gen X person, like I was just considered a nerd. Like I had to form my own like social groups and stuff of, of people and meeting people online and stuff. But, you know, that the metaverse is happening now. If you think of it as a creative space where you can build things, a place where you can project your identity and interact with other people all that all that is there yeah yeah it's true is is uh you know the 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 way that we think about the metaverse uh has been around and and especially our our kids and i have a a seven-year-old and a three-year-old and even they have you know started to uh you know interact in different parts of the metaverse and so it's the, you know, the older generation that um, doesn't realize that it's already around us. So I think that's a, a, a very uh, a good point. Um, you know, now we could talk, though, about yeah. like, what are the things that would make it a lot bit better than it all sure. already is? Because we could certainly look at what we have and and you can very easily see a lot of things that you want to make better. So like if we talk about hardware, for example, and we want to think about the VR aspects of this, I don't want a dorky big headset that weighs a couple pounds on my head. It's uncomfortable. It does. It has one hour battery life. Like these things aren't really something I can incorporate in my life, but when it's more like sunglasses that I wear and I get all those capabilities around digital holograms and stuff, whether it's AR, VR, and the battery life lasts as long as my phone does right now, well, then it becomes something that I'm going to incorporate into my life. If we think about like Web3 and digital wallets and all that stuff, like the ergonomics of that software is as bad as the ergonomics as the hardware is right now for VR in the sense that like it's clunky to set up, like digital wallets, it's just not easy to use. And Mm -hmm the whole process of like, you got to buy some currency before you can do anything. And it takes a couple of weeks for the average person before you're even going to go from like your first Coinbase purchase to getting it in a MetaMask or something where you can use a web application. I mean, having built a lot of games in my life, I can tell you how much the fall off, (laughs) the percentage fall off and conversion is for very basic um, speed bumps that you throw in front of a potential customer, but, you know, web three and wallet tech and currencies are not small speed bumps. They're like massive ones where people just check out mentally. And then I think the last category is like the creative tools to make stuff in this space is still really, really hard. You have to be either a professional who builds games for a living and uses 3d modeling tools or a very, devoted enthusiast who really wants to learn how to use these technologies, even Roblox, which is easier to do a lot of things is still pretty technical when you get into building stuff, but that's the opportunity around technologies like generative AI. Like there's a future here where you're just going to speak whole worlds into existence. And then if it isn't exactly what you want, you're going to say something and it's going to change it the way you want. It's going to be more like the holodeck from Star Trek, which is this subject I had in a, in a recent blog post, but like we're moving towards more of a holodeck version of the, the metaverse where these worlds will be created by you very rapidly. It's, it's not going to be coding. It's going to start top down from concept instead of bottom up from building blocks. Yeah. And what do you think of, of organizations that are, are looking at this? Um, you know, those that have not yet jumped in, um, but are very, you know, curious about how they make an entry point um, for those listeners here who are interested in um, whether they have a, a small, medium business or uh, a, a bigger company and want to get into the metaverse. Um, what are some pathways that they can start doing that or start strategizing around that? 
Well, I, a lot is going to have to do with what kind of business you are. I, I think something interesting to think about is what are the opportunities for you to co-create experiences with your customers, right? So, um, you know, with games, games today, a lot of it is a co-creation process. We have all these modern communities that make things and extend capabilities. There's people come into a social game and form guilds. So their contribution is like socialization. So I would urge people to take a step back from like a specific definition of here's a particular platform. Like I've identified, like you identify something that calls itself metaverse Roblox or Fortnite or Decentraland or whatever it is that they kind of caught your imagination around that. Rather than targeting something specific, think about, well, how do I go back to the way culture has evolved as we were discussing earlier? So how do I take advantage of the fact that people's digital identity is really important to them? And if I could enable them online and then create things with them, right? That's the lesson from online games. The more you give people the opportunity to create with you, like Minecraft, the fact that people could create in it was enormous. Roblox, it's a creative platform. So think about those things in your business. But, you know, the manifestation of that is going to be very, very different according to what kind of business you are. We could probably identify like a category and spend an hour just like spitballing ideas for a particular kind of business, how you would, how you would get involved there. Yeah. And, and one final question on the metaverse um, before we kind of go to some closing questions. Uh, Is there anything that you think that we might not be thinking about or, you know, something that maybe isn't talked about as much about, you know, our future um, as it comes to technology or the metaverse or things in our lives. You know, our lives have changed a lot in the past few years, just, you know, even from COVID and people's kind of views on even travel or experiencing things virtually. We've seen what chat GPTs have done it only in the last couple of months, right? In terms of how we think about how we can better, you know, do work using AI. Uh, what What's coming? Like, what's, what do you think that um, maybe people aren't really seeing on the radar that, you know, your, your experience and background can shed the light on? I, I think we're setting out on a very exciting next few years, next decade, in which people are going to become way more creative than they ever have before. Like my personal completely ridiculous goal is like, could we multiply by 10 the number of like real creators in the world? I think a lot of the reasons why people don't create things, sometimes it's because they're not interested and that's fine. Like, you know, we got 8 billion people in the world and it it may be that we won't get 8 billion of them creating things for whatever reason. But I think there's billions of people that want to be creators where either it's a lack of time because let's face it, you know, people have a day-to-day existence and they have to work and they have to do all the things that, that keep them going. And that squeezes out a lot of time that you could be creative and, or, You're creative about something, but there's a lot of steps in the way that you have to get through to get to the thing that you actually want to make. And for, you know, games is a great example of that. As we were talking about much earlier, games are creative products and what you make is what the player experiences. Everything leading up to that is part of a very complex technical process today that no one really cares about. You know, you care about it as the craftsperson working on it. And and many of us love all those little nitty gritty details, but the the customer, the player, they don't really care about that. They care about what they get to do. So, you know, if we can free up more time for people, Mm -hmm. which can happen either because we make work more efficient throughout the world. So you get more hours back in the day, or we let you use those scarce few hours that you've got that you can be creative and make you much more productive in that time. Mm -hmm. That's how we're going to get to that 10 Xing of creativity as a planet. And that's going to be amazing because that means that many more songs, that many more 
pieces of furniture, houses, games, like all, like scientific papers, like everything out there that requires creative thought and creative production, we're going to have a lot more of. So I'm super excited about all the things we're going to do. And these things like generative AI are one of the technologies that's going to help us get there because it's going to allow you to take statements about what you want and prompt things into existence. Yeah, I'm so excited about um, the future of the creator economy and, you know, the democratization of these tools that is going to, you know, help them make content more, much more efficiently and, um, you know, much more compelling content um, in, in, in ways that, you know, is unimaginable. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. We're very excited about that at Superworld. Um, you know, a couple of fun little questions to kind of end. Um, you know, if you know, I, I loved your book recommendation. You have these great number of books uh, behind you, and I love that in your background. I'm a big reader. Um, you know, I think we're always looking to learn. Uh, in in general, those of us that like to read, just curious. Uh, you know, if you could take anyone to lunch, uh, and you know, uh, living or dead, like in you know, in history, et cetera, like. Who would who would you want to meet? Who would you want to get to know? Um, what would you want to know about them or their life or lessons? What, what, who would who would you invite? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, I, I'd almost have to categorize it in, into a few different areas. If if I could in, if I could talk to any entrepreneur who's lived, it would have to be Steve Jobs because I think he had. Um, a unique combination of skills, the ability to envision really how you had to package something into a total solution that would be compelling. He wasn't the only person who could do that though, but then he combined it with such a persuasive, you know, magic that he had to, to convince people of that vision being the right vision. He also had an incredible power to, sort of distill down to the essence of what was really going to be important. I think he said stuff about how, how you know, you want to actually say no to a lot of things, not yes to a lot of things. So he was really good at that. Feels like a lesson I should learn personally. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, I think, I think it would be great to meet Steve Jobs. Yeah. No, and I never did, unfortunately. Yeah. No, I, 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 I definitely agree. Uh, I, I do reread his, biography every now and then just to remind myself and there's so many great resources out there I watch a lot of his videos so uh, that's a good one um, I'm going to end with a, a fun question you know Superworld's all about the real world uh, you're an adventurer um, you know, we have a virtual real estate platform where people can acquire virtual real estate anywhere in places they love. If you're back to your, you know, 21 year old self, uh, and you had free reign, um, and you could, you know, acquire virtual real estate anywhere in the world, where, what's a special place for you, uh, or special places and what's the story behind that? Um, well, I have acquired a place in, in Superworld, so I'll talk about that particular cool. place. So um, it, there's this place called Tikal in Guatemala where they have all these ancient pyramids. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a super cool place just to see the pyramids, but it's also famous for the fact that um, Star Wars, the original movie, A New Hope, that's where you see the X-Wing fighters taking off to go and battle the Death Star at the end of the movie. And they yeah. like zip past the, so I bought the view of that in Tikal thinking, yeah, that, that has a connection to me because Star Wars is certainly one of my favorite movies. Um, and I just imagined someday making some kind of AR representation in that space. That's awesome. I love, <laughs> that. I love that movie too. My kids are now about the age where, they're interested in Star Wars. So I'm very excited to, you know, jumping into all of those episodes. So, well, thank you so much, John. It's It's been a pleasure. And, you know, thanks so much for your leadership in this space and everything that you do to support everyone in the ecosystem. Very excited again to, um, you know, continue our conversation and and to, uh, you know, uh, continue uh, ways that we can all work together. It, can you tell us about ways that people can find you online? What, what, you know, things that you're doing or uh, things that we should know um, that, that are coming up. 
Well, if you're a game developer or you're trying to build something in the metaverse or a metaverse of your own, definitely come to beamable.com that, that you can find me there. Um, I have a blog called Building the Metaverse on Medium. Um, you can find it by Googling that or I'm on Twitter, Jay Radoff at Twitter. I'm John Radoff on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm on a lot of places online. You won't have too much difficulty finding me if you want. So love to connect with anybody who's building things, who's thinking about, you know, 3D graphics or persistent worlds or, you know, generative AI. Those are all like right in my wheelhouse and what I'm excited about. Awesome. Thank you again. Excited to, uh, you know, have this conversation with you today and, and uh, you know, excited to uh, continue. So thanks again, John, for being on Building a Better World. Thank you so much. It's been fun. See ya.